Extinction challenges our thinking and writing. Such overwhelming disappearance of ways of being, experiencing and making meaning in the world disrupt familiar categories and demand new modes of response. It requires that we trace multiple forms of both countable and intangible loss, the unravelling of social and ecological communities as a result of colonialism and capture, development and deformation and other destructive processes. It calls forth new modes of commemoration and mourning and new practices of archiving and survival. It calls for action in the absence of hope and for the recognition and nourishment of new generativities, new modes of assemblage and attachment, resurgence and reworlding, commoning, composting and caring for country. I begin with this paragraph composed under the influence of the generously collaborative thought of my colleagues in the Extinction Studies Working Group, some of whom are here today, and one most notably who is not, our dear teacher Beb Deborah Bird Rose, who wrote so passionately against extinction as the dire outcome of intertwined processes of genocide and ecocide, and whose thought and example we miss dearly. What would it take to face up to the sixth mass extinction event? What would it mean to stay with this intensely troubling trouble, an ethical and ex existential problem like no other? Contemporary philosophy, science and culture, it seems to me, are bound with ways of appearing to respond to it while in fact turning away. The meditations on the potential apocalyptic or far future non-existence of humans that one finds in the writings of cosmic pessimists and speculative realists while they may push us further beyond the ends of man, downplay the actual crisis of animal extinction that the human hoarding of significance has produced. Techno-capitalist fantasies of resurrecting absent species, which also abound and excite, only promise to bring into being wretched short-lived clones. Our philosophies lack in large part the zoological imagination to adequately confront the actual extinction of living kinds that we are producing and witnessing. This is one of the tragic ironies of the Anthropocene. At the very moment that our culture has come to recognise the complex subjectivities of our animal kin, we also come to learn about the mass extinctions global capitalism is causing. While being nauseated by the modern production of mass slaughter and deformation, we are simultaneously dizzied by the proliferation of animal culture and technology, the social behaviours and cognitive achievements of marine mammals, birds and apes, the great variety of animal emotions and forms of intelligence that surround us and that are disappearing. What is paved over in red lists and databases is that what is vanishing is not just biological species but unique perspectives, distinctive forms of life and phenomenal worlds. Eileen Christ makes this clear with characteristic vigour. Alongside destroying biological kinds, natural habitats and populations of animals, she writes, we are deleting the Earth's noumenal dimensions elaborated through emotion, intention, understanding, perception, experience. In other words, through varieties of aware being shaping and adorning the world as home. Animals are not world poor, but both the world and our own being are rendered poor without them. What would it take to stay with this horror in its full existential significance as the unravelling and extinguishment of an entwined multiplicity of meaning making worlds? But also, and importantly, to pile a second Anthropocene irony upon the first, what would it mean to properly account for the complexity of the hybrid or multiply constituted terrain that results from our practical efforts to combat extinction? A terrain characterised not only by destruction and impoverishment, but also through certain salvific and transformative counter-extinction practices, including those of conservation biology, by novel forms of relational becoming. How are we to act? If the call for multi-species justice demands that we prevent the extinction of unique forms of life, and yet such conservatory acts are themselves transformative of the very beings we want to save. New perspectives on these problems have been enabled by recent scholarship on biocultural extinction, which is tied together by semiotics, ecophenomenology, existentialism, and philosophical ethology with multi-species ethnography. In thinking with other cultures, Certain strands of anthropology have proffered multinaturalist and perspectivist ontologies as a challenge to Western naturalism and its relegation both of other cultures and of other beings and not just natural beings such as animals 
to the status of mere opinion, belief or fiction. The last few days here have brought such questions about ontological and cosmopolitics to the forefront of thinking about multi-species justice. The challenge is to understand and make possible a world of many worlds, to quote the title of Marisol's recent collection, in which different ways of being are able to compose together. This formula resonates all too painfully in the context of the existential profundity of extinction in a way that Vincian de Prey has brought to the fore in her meditation on what is lost with the passenger pigeon. It is a whole world that has disappeared, she writes, and it is the world that bursts with their absence. My own work has been in the history and philosophy of animal sciences. What might be added by the, by the anthropology of this element of our own culture, of the sciences of the moderns in the sense of Latour and Stengers, and in particular of those knowledge practices that have taught us so much about the cultures and subjectivities and even ontologies of other creatures. Sciences, su sciences such as ethology and animal psychology, which brought important lessons about who animals are and what they are capable of. And sciences such as zoobiology and conservation biology, with their own lessons about how we, or at least certain expert representatives, might best negotiate relationships with disturbed animals in artificial or hybrid environments. These sciences have certainly participated in various and often extreme ways in the naturalistic objectification of animals, their reduction to machines of instinct and learning. But it is nonetheless possible to find in the archive of their history certain minor concepts, practices and technologies that we might recognise as offering an alternate ontology of animal subjectivities. It remains to be seen how they might be used to help invent practices adequate to the terrain of multi-species diplomacy in the Anthropocene. One of the names most often associated with the scientific attempt to understand animals' perspectives is that of Jakob von Uxkull, the Baltic German theoretical biologist whose Umwelt theory foregrounded animals' phenomenal worlds, the fields of perception and action that matched inner, and inner imperatives and environmental cues as part of a holistic web of interconnected elements. And while his approach has long, long since been eclipsed by other biological paradigms, its spirit lives on in a number of curious ways from Tartu and Copenhagen, where it, is, where it has inspired a distinctive school of biosemiotics, to Freiburg and Paris, where Uck School's biology was used by phenomenologists and post-structuralists as a jumping off point for new conceptions of human and animal life. Brett Buchanan's work has made clear the strength of his influence in continental philosophy, from Heidegger to Merleau-Ponty to Deleuze, and others have traced it uh, further afield in Cangriem and others. It has also undergone something of a renaissance in post-humanities and environmental humanities scholarship and in multi-species ethnography, where both Uxkul in particular and semiotics in general have been important in situating humanity's supposedly unique symbolic language and thought within a more general context of signification, a web of life that in this perspective is meaningful and interpretive all the way down. What might be the significance of this ontoethology for thinking through conservation in the Anthropocene? A good example of both its promises and dangers comes from the conclusion to Carlo Brentari's book about Uxkul, in which he considers the relevance of Umwelt theory to the hybrid natures and anthropogenic ecosystems of the Anthropocene. If it is true that they are constantly evolving systems, Brentari writes, if it is also true that in the short term that is, in the context of human history and the technologically induced acceleration that has experienced in the last two centuries, the sign systems that support every single environment are not able to keep pace with sudden changes. But if the, correct in but if the corrective interpretive relationships between organisms and reality breaks, the result is the extinction of the species. The work of Uxkul, in other words, can help, to help the contemporary ecological thought to understand that safeguarding biodiversity does not mean so much preserving the animals as defending the Umwelten, the semiotic, perceptive and operative worlds in which life unfolds. With what we said previously in mind, the survival of a species in captivity or in an excessively anthropised environment presents no substantial difference from its physical disappearance because the animal subjects that compose it are no longer able to exercise their abilities of transcendental, transcendental constitution and then of interpretation of the biosemiotic environment. And without being able to express these fundamental aspects of their constitution, they cannot be said to be truly alive. This passage, I think, encapsulates at the same time the important Uxkulian insight that species endangerment is fundamentally a question of meaning 
and also the extent to which this recognition can still be impacted by what seems to me a dualist metaphysics separating nature from culture. Significantly, Brentari identifies the modern acceleration of anthropogenic environmental change as a disruption not only to ecosystems but also to non-human sign systems, ways of making the world meaningful, and connects this disruption to the threat of extinction, stressing the importance of conserving not just the organism but the umwelt, the animal's meaningful world. And he forcefully targets the excessive humanisation of animals' environments that does indeed often leave them lost or confused, unable to negotiate their lives. But in equating survival in captivity or transformed environments with extinction and death, Bentari here falls into a dualistic trap that is common, I think, in humanities thinking about animals for which such anthropogenic change can only be conceived in homogeneously destructive terms as humanization, domestication or artifactualization. Animals transformed by humans here are as if dead. Yet the dynamics of human-animal relationships in anthropogenically altered environments are, it seems to be, much more complex and multivalent than this fall narrative suggests. We cannot effectively clarify and critique various forms of harm to animal life worlds if we reduce all contact and relationality to such univocal destruction. To negotiate our relationships with wildlife in the Anthropocene, we need better ways of describing and thinking about how humans and animals are changed by contact with each other, not only in captivity, but extending to the full range of interventions and encounters. And these are inescapably ontological questions. It's interesting in this regard to trace Uxful's reception in more scientific and practical domains, not only in field ethology, but also in the zoological garden and in the practices of conservation biology. These are, for me, fascinating terrains in that they bring to the forefront certain distinctive and important questions to do with precisely such anthropogenic effects, that is, the ways in which animals are changed through their encounters with humans, that I want to situate within a broader attention to the animal seen in the light of its futurity, its plurality and its singularity, that is, the question of animalities. Attending to these sciences can help us to understand both the destruction and damage of non-human life produced by apparatuses of colonial and capitalist capture and development, but also the development of novel relationships and transformations produced in unprecedented contact zones. This is a tension that is found, I think, in the friction between certain more celebratory modes of the post and environmental humanities and other more critical forms of scholarship in animal studies, for example, a problem framed with particular insight by Dinesh in his recent work. And, is it a ten and it is a tension that I think we need to work through rather than simply try to resolve in favour of either pole. A good place to start might be with the thoughts on the zoo of Uxkul himself. In 1940, Uxkul wrote a short letter to the director of the Leipzig, Leipzig Zoological Garden, one Karl Max Schneider, expounding on and complaining about certain aspects of the presentation of the animals that occurred to him during a personal tour by his interlocutor. The letter was published in Der Zoologische Garden, the premier zoo biology journal, along with Herr Schneider's somewhat lengthier response. And my thanks go to Alexander Beatty for performing this translation. Sparing little space for polite compliments of Leipzig's beautiful zoo, von Uxkul immediately outlines two theoretical problems. The first concerns the design of the climbing rock for baboons, which is, he says, not yet thought through according to Umwelt. Properly designed on the principles of Uxkulian theoretical biology, which identify the unique perceptual and active dimensions of each creature's world, such an exhibit would no longer be arbitrarily and inadequately used, but, like the musical harmony he perceived in nature itself, would be designed for each animal, matched to the capabilities of each species and constructors so as to enable them to properly and impressively, quote, demonstrate their climbing skills in the clearly preferred fashion. The installation of such facilities and obstacles, he argues, would be beneficial both for the curiosity of the viewers and for the health of the animals. The second problem is that of training. Uxkul bemoans the artificiality of circus tricks in which animals perform what he calls feats completely foreign to their normal umwelt. But it is not training as such that he finds distasteful, but rather ludicrous tricks that make fools, as he says, 
of the animals instead of de demonstrating their remarkable aptitude for both their own benefit and the zoos. Imagine instead, he says, a trained, satiated lion living among flamingos and deer. And he goes on to describe a pastoral vision in which predator and pay, prey pay no mind to each other, a sight that would no doubt make what he calls an overwhelming impression upon the zoo's human visitors. Uxkul imagines his colleague's objection that, quote, it cannot be the task of the zoological garden to simulate an animal paradise for the spectator, that it doesn't exist in nature. But the zoo, he argues, is not free nature, but itself a simulation. And what is it precisely that constitutes the zoo's artificiality in Uxkul's letter? He does not highlight its unnatural architecture and organisation in general, or the disturbing presence of the visitors, but rather the animals' meaningful relationships with the zookeepers themselves, a fact that Schneider, like many in his profession, are on occasion somewhat blind to. He writes, Let's not forget that in the zoological garden, every animal must be supervised by a keeper who's ent who enters into a companionship with the animal which doesn't occur in nature. It activates a new carrier of significance in the umwelt of each animal, overseeing and influencing its every move. Every keeper is, whether he wants to be or not, an animal trainer. And given the unavoidability of that human influence on their wards, we should ask, he says, whether it were possible to apply the animal trainer to the improvement of the zoological garden, rather than making beautiful animals into fools in a silly exposition. Uxwell's vision for the zoo is one in which exhibit design and training interactions both suit the animal's capabilities, understood in terms of Umwelt, and produce greater freedom in interactions between animals. And while he recognises certain biological limits to how much an animal can be trained to ignore its prey, he believes that proper understanding of and commitment to the task on the part of zookeepers could lead them to, quote, achieve astonishing success. This awareness of the keeper-animal relationship that Uxkul highlights was central to the work of the most influential zoo biologist of the 20th century, Heine Hedegger, an intriguing figure who I've written and spoken about at length elsewhere. Hedegger, whose main legacy is to have laid the foundations of zookeeping as a science conducted according to what he called properly biological principles, was in fact a follower of Uxkul's Umwelt theory and a strong supporter of zoo semiotics as developed by his friend Thomas Siebiok. In one of his most famous passages, Hedegger explains the significance of captivity for an animal in precisely Uxkulian terms. Each animal lives in its own specific world, he says. The environment, milieu, offers, as it were, a reservoir of stimuli from which the subject constructs its own world. The building material consists of a variety of things of vital importance or biological interest to the animal. By capturing it, we utterly destroy the animal's previous world and put it into a different environment. The animal must construct an entirely fresh subjective world. This means an enormous task and is easy to understand that any, every individual cannot tackle it successfully. Importantly, Hedegaard emphasises that the ta this task of constructing a new Umwelt, which, like Uxkul, he saw as the role of zoo biology to facilitate, crucially involved a change of significance of the human being for the animal, from what he called the universal enemy, enemy from which one should always flee, to a trusted partner and friend. Hedegaard's work was in many ways devoted towards realising Uxkul's vision for the zoo, operationalising this knowledge of the animal's perspective, not necessarily towards exhibitionary performances of their abilities, as Uxkul imagined, though Hedegaard on occasion did express his own vision for what he called a laboratory circus that would refine animal training, but towards modernising the zoo as a biopolitical institution, in which animals no longer so often display the recalcitrance that Hedegaard here somewhat uncomfortably indicates but are able to be propagated and reproduced, to be made to live within artificial conditions that replicate in some minimal but nonetheless significant way the natural significance of the environment that has been taken from them. There's a lot more to be said about the genealogy of the zoo, from the suffering and dysfunction produced in the history of capture, to the development of this biopolitical apparatus of care and reproduction, to efforts at reintroduction 
featuring the confusion and death of captive born animals who never learned how to survive in the wild and curious rituals by which they are trained to perform their own species being. And there have been many texts written by humanities and social science scholars that critique this colonial and anthropocentric institution from the perspective of animal welfare and animal rights. In my work on this long and regularly painful history, I found that the most effective way to politicise this institution is in terms of ontology, through questions of relationship and subjectivity. Who does it make of its subjects? Foucault's work on the historicity of the relationship between subjects and objects, that is the political history of truth, helps us to frame this question about how new types of subjects are produced in the process of producing knowledge about them. In his later work, he expands his genealogy of the human sciences and their practices of subjection and subjectification to refer to what he calls a political ontology of ourselves. And this is a question that I think can also profitably be asked about animals. In the specific context of their observation and reproduction, taming and training, and conservation and salvation, particularly in the face of species endangerment, where their ongoing form of life is itself existentially at stake, how are they subjected and subjectified? That is, who are these animals today? This is a domain, I've argued, of ethopolitics, where animals are governed not just in their bodies as living beings, as biopower is defined, but in their souls in their cognitive and behavioural capacities, where their cultural learned patterns of conduct, the hard-won skills and knowledge passed down through generations, the very characteristics on which they depend for survival in their biotope, become, in a world of anthropogenic change and hybrid environments, a social and political problem, are problematised as a domain that is of ethopolitical power, knowledge and intervention. What is at stake here is not just their welfare or rights, their pleasure and pain, but both their existence and their identity. The, eth the ethico-political question regarding animal lives here becomes not only one of whether they can speak or suffer, but one of who they are today, here or there, in these new, fragile, tricky relationships with our profoundly, profoundly transformative species and its profoundly transformative economies. Are they still themselves? If not, who are they then? Are they really as if dead? And if not, in what does this new form of life consist? Yet the deeper that I delved into the history of zoobiology, its peculiar achievements as well as its abject failures, and in particular, the more that I read of Hedegaard's writing, which includes not only zoobiology manuals, but also speculative works of animal psychology that meditate on topics from animal sleep and dreaming to animals' own ontological characterizations, categorizations sorry, of the world, their use of proper names for each other, to the mutual assimilation of humans and animals as genuine social partners. And here I refer you to the translation of Hedegaard's Theodor Verstein as understanding animals by environmental philosopher Anna Katerina Lavoisier that's forthcoming in Springer's Biosemiotic series. The more that I looked at this work, the more it seemed important not only to politicise the knowledge produced within this institution, but also to ask what we might learn from it. A question that Foucault's approach puts to one side. Thus I turned to Isabel Stengers, the philosopher of, sci the philosopher of science who from within that same tradition sought to rescue in a sense the sciences from being understood merely as tribunals of power over things and subjects. In the invention of modern science, she asked about the singularity of the modern sciences, seeking to protect the successes of theoretical experimental sciences such as physics and chemistry, while at the same time refusing the reductionism that would assess all forms of science and knowledge practice from the perspective of that laboratory model. Importantly, in Stenger's philosophy of science, the objects of knowledge, whether things, plants, animals or otherwise, possess their own power to put to the test the knowing, investigating subject and their models. This is particularly significant when it comes to the field sciences, which she argues possess their own singularity, their own distinctive 
problematic an appetite that, are tied, that is tied to their historicity, their variability, their decentered localization, the uncontrollability of their terrain, and their irreducible uncertainty, which stems from a modification, as she says, in the relations between subject and object, between those who pose questions and those who respond to them. Their objects are not made to exist as in the lab, but pre-exist the subject of knowledge. It is no longer a matter of making them be, but of following them. The singularity of the field sciences is, is significant, especially insofar as their objects are themselves subjects, with the ability to bear witness for themselves, who are not unmoved by the fact that scientists ask questions about them or intervene on their behalf. Stengers writes, what they are concerned with, what the, the scientists are concerned with, rats, baboons or humans in these field sciences, are able to be interested in the questions asked them, that is to interpret from their own point of view the meaning of the apparatus interrogating them. That is, again, to make themselves exist in a mode that actively integrates the question. Yet things become more complicated. The situation is completely different, she says, when the history through which the interrogator seeks to become an author, a producer of knowledge, also makes history for the one being interrogated. That is, when the conditions for the production of knowledge of the first are equally and inevitably conditions for the production of the existence of the second. Stengers takes up here the example of the ape language experiments of the late 20th century, a case that Dominique Lestel has investigated in great detail, and identifies the, the peculiar stakes of these experiments. The price of this production of knowledge, she says, is the production of new beings, hybrid beings whose potential competencies we reveal by plunging them into an intensely human universe, where the questions that create meaning for us take on meaning for them. They literally lived within the families of the, as family members of the scientists who were studying them. Stengers goes on to contrast the ape language experiments to zoo biology and wildlife biology. These animals, she says, cannot simply be returned to their natural environment or to a zoo, um, possessing a dependency which produces a special responsibility on the part of the scientists to take care of them for the entirety of their lives. But it seems to me that between the intensely human universe, as she says, of the talking apes, for example, and the field of their natural environment where they, where they might imagine to be returned, there is not a dichotomy but a punctuated continuum, not only of overlapping milieus, anthropogenically transformed in multiple complex ways, but also of intertwined responsibilities that emerge from the variety of changes our interventions have provoked. Moreover, it is precisely the contours of this hybrid terrain that zoo biology has both formed and clarified. The singularity of zoo biology as a modern science here is to have posed as its object of knowledge and intervention, not necessarily uh, the animal subjects themselves, but precisely this problem of the potential for animal life to flourish in anthropogenic environments. It asks, what are the physiological and psychological needs of this, this particular species, or another one, that will enable it to live, to be healthy, to reproduce? Which modifications to its environment produce deleterious effects and which make little or no difference? Are we capable of intervening in their milieu or even developing relationships with them, attachments to them, in a way that does not harm them, but that perhaps even helps them to thrive? How can we identify and remediate the deleterious effects of our own constructions and interventions? What is being put to the test here is no longer so much the animals, but the practices of the scientists themselves. Their ability to choreograph relationships between animals and their environments so that they do not end up in misunderstanding, dysfunction and abnormality, but rather enable what they call natural, normal or norm producing conduct to be explored and expressed. This zoobiological problematization of the anthropogenic transformation of animal behavior and environments only grows more significant in relation to the broken web of ecological meaning 
that conservationists are faced with in the ever more humanised environments of the 21st century. In the case of conservation biology, where the threat of extinction means that the very existence of the animal subjects is what's at stake, here again, the situation is completely different, as Stengers puts it, and disconcertingly so. It is not just that in order to produce knowledge about them, one ends up transforming them, but rather that in order for them to continue to exist at all, one must produce a knowledge of the conditions they need and a power to maintain them, despite their fragility, and despite the fact that these activities too of the scientists are themselves a vector of becoming, as Stengers calls it, that engenders responsibility for its own effects. Whether this crisis science of conservation biology is successful will be determined in each case by and in the very beings, very being, sorry, of the animals themselves, by whether and in what form they manage to continue to exist. And it provokes troubling questions of its own. What will intervening so as to protect their very existence make of them in trying to keep their entire world from disappearing, how do we avoid the injustice of impoverishment, of transforming them into a version of themselves that seems to us as if it were already dead? These are questions ultimately of, di of diplomacy, of practices of peace deployed against what both Dominique Estelle and Dinesh Wadiwal have char characterised as a war against animals. As Stengers writes in her essay on the transition from cosmopolitics to ontological politics, characterising scientists as diplomats engaged with and for a world, in a way, diplomats are by themselves creatures of speculation. They intervene where war seems the logical outcome and work for a peace that might be possible, for a partial articulation between antagonistic commitments, for the possibility of a world where many worlds would fit. This is the sort of multi-species diplomacy imagined by Vincian de Pre, when in her book titled After Isaiah's P Peaceable Kingdom, she writes, why not transform ourselves in order to transform the animals? It is the sort of hybrid community imagined by Dominique Gastel when in an essay on making peace with animals, he writes, the challenge is to create another culture, a central dimension of which is to make a multiplicity of infinities coexist. As an extreme horizon of thought and justice, part of the impact of the wretched event of extinction is that it reveals to us the full depth and significance of the ecological multi-species communities in which we are embedded. The multiplicity of unique forms of non-human meaning making that are being meaninglessly destroyed and the fragile gifts of intergenerational transmission of learned ancestral wisdom by which such perspectives are constituted. Paying attention to the singularity of the sciences that are deployed against this extinction event also demands that we recognise the necessarily transformative dimension of these practices as vectors of becoming that become meaningful for those subjected to them, become part of their history and give, and give rise to forms of multi-species responsibility. If every keeper is a trainer, as Uxkul said, if every conservationist is a cosmopolitical diplomat, especially those who teach apes and monkeys how to forage and which predators to avoid, or those who intervene between ranchers and wolves, then the question is not simply one of conserving endangered species or returning them to some state of nature, but of asking what sort of performance do you want to choreograph? What sort of peace do you want to broker? In some cases, the very reasonable answer given will be one that actually masks our relationship, masks human presence that prevents them from becoming dependent on or too closely connected to human beings in order both to protect them from other anthropogenic harms and to maintain their own autonomous capacity for survival. But in other cases, we might legitimately seek the mutually transformative sharing of meaning between subjects in multi-species communities. For Hedegaard, 
humans and animals could become authentic social partners. And he dreamed beyond Ook School not only of an animal paradise that could be performed for zoo visitors, but of encounters and indeed a world or worlds in which genuine communication and mutually enriching partnerships are made possible between humans and animals. Thank you.